Hello again and welcome back. So we uh, talk about the negative construction of minorities in our first video. Now we are going to talk about um, positive constructions of minorities, so to speak. So minorities as pioneers of democratic renovation or democratic innovation. I put it renovation because uh, the cases I have been studying have uh, come up with certain innovations, but not completely uh, innovations because they have picked up certain things or uh, dug up certain things from their history and their historical institutions, values and norms and uh, mixed and merged it with the innovations they have made as political movements as well. So that's why it's neither renovation completely nor innovation, but re-innovation. Uh, I will try to come up with something better, a better concept, but uh, for the time being, we will go with re-innovation. So there are positive constructions and of uh, progressive responses from minorities against the, their negative construction. Um, by uh, specifically nation states, there is the uh, we we will talk about council democracy and its transformation to a model of autonomy, and lastly we will talk about democratic renovations of values and institutions in the cases I have been studying. Positive constructions, uh, how about them? Well, uh, some authors or scholars have been um, arguing that minorities have been constructed as anomalies, but in reality, they transform oppressive political orders and contribute to democratization all over the world. So uh, look at the United States, for instance, and uh, the civil rights movement that the black, the black minority, so to speak, uh, have uh, the, the contribution they have made into democratization in the United States for the last two or three centuries, or in other uh, contexts in Latin America, in Turkey, the Kurdish minority, and in other uh, liberal or uh, hybrid democracies where uh, minorities appear as a force for good, as a force for democratization. And such scholarship is, you know, on... Um, uh, has been such scholarship is increasing the number of uh, scholarship at least so they they of course minorities challenge monistic notions of national identity and sovereignty and they revitalize communal collective culture language autonomy sovereignty does contributing to diversity or keeping diversity alive as well and they are uh, they have been re renovating or innovating direct democratic mechanisms and institutions of political participation. So you might think that, well, direct democracy is no more, but actually minorities have been engaging in certain direct democratic political participation. They also create progressive alternatives. So there are new models of autonomy that I'm going to speak uh, that has been that have been established by minorities. And the, the, there are more democratic forms of uh, and these new models of autonomy are not only for minorities, there also can be actually more democratic forms of government for all. So council democracy and its transformation to a model of autonomy we are coming to our specific uh, theme. Council democracy is a form of government alternative to representative democracy. It's based on small scale public assemblies, like these assemblies are open to all dwellers or to all, citizen, all citizens, and councils of delegates instead of centralized parliaments comprised of few hundred representatives. The difference between delegates and representatives is just put it simply, the community or the assembly can call delegates anytime and they can uh, end their, uh, let's say, uh, end their uh, 
if it is, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't want to say representation, but they can, you know, decommission them. So delegates are basically tasked with the uh, responsibility of carrying the word and the will of a group of people or an assembly to another uh, group of people, to another assembly, and they can be recalled anytime. This, the same thing is not applied to representatives. They are elected for a period of time, and unless they commit a crime, for instance, uh, it, it will depend in the context on the context, of course. Unless they are uh, they complete they commit a crime that is not compatible with the task of being a representative, then they will stay in their. Uh, they will be. They will continue being a representative of that community or that constituency until the end of that election pe period. So uh, assemblies and councils embody power to the people. So power to the people is not only a slogan, it, it has its own institutions and these assemblies and councils are actually the institutions of power to the people. Political participation and public freedom exercised directly in these institutions. So uh, ideally, there will be no political parties in a setting of council democracy, no professional politicians, no payment for public work, uh, although the cases differ. But council democracy as a form of government has never been established in a state or in a, in a large scale as uh, we can see in nation states in history because they have fallen prey to party politics in nation states, especially in modern times. I'm referring to modern times, of course, but in the past, uh, there will be uh, some um, forms of council democracy or some forms of direct democracy in the before modernity in ancient times or in uh, medieval city states. But uh, of course, in theory, you could see that the um, it's considered to re-emerge during protests and revolutions. So uh, last uh, people who have interest in Turkey, they might remember the Gezi protest in Turkey uh, in 1913. Well, during those protests, there emerged more than 30 neighborhood assemblies, uh, which will, of course, uh, be a testimony to the the, the fact that they emerge and re-emerge during protests and, and revolutions. There are historical references in Western political theory. It's mainly American French revolutions, the Paris Commune, Russian revolutions in the 20th century, the Hungarian revolution, Spanish Civil War. But recent research shows that democratic assemblies emerged all over the world since antiquity. So city-states in ancient Mesopotamia, Mesoamerica, and the Mediterranean. So uh, uh, tell you one secret, democracy was not born in Athens and uh, direct democracy. By, by democracy, we mean democracy in general and direct democracy. Uh, so um, we have to change this perception that democracy, the first democracy was uh, ancient Athens. No, uh, the first democracy was not ancient Athens. But uh, we know most about ancient Athens because we have more, we have something written about it uh, more than any other, any other city state or any other context that there was uh, direct democracy or democracy. My cases are uh, the rebels of Atisto Autonomous Municipalities in Chiapas, Mexico, the town of Cheran in Michoacan, Mexico, and the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, otherwise known as Rojava. I have been studying on these uh, three cases, three autonomous administrations, uh, because all of them have uh, a variety, um, all three of them have a variety of council democracy, a variety of direct democracy in place. Mexico, those um, visualizing might help. This is Mexico and this is the, the red part is Chiapas. Uh, I was in uh, San Cristobal for a while. I went to Caracol Oventic in the Zapatista region. Uh, this is 
Mexico again. The red part is Michoacan, the state of Michoacan. I was in Cheran at the middle. Uh, this is Syrian. Um, uh, sorry. The map of Syria and the, the northern part is North and uh, the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, otherwise known as Rojava. So a wee summary of the cases, just that I will go through very quick. In 1994, uh, the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional launched a rebellion of mainly indigenous communities in Chiapas. And uh, they maintain a self-rule based on community assemblies, regional committees, and a general committee. In 2011, led by women, the people of Cheran, a town in Michoacan, Mexico, drove the organized crime out of the town and political parties as well, not only the organized crime. They set self-defense perimeters, uh, a general assembly and eight councils elected and delegated by neighborhood assemblies rules the town. Federal electoral court in Mexico ruled in favor of this administration, so they are actually formal now. And in 2012, Syrian regime withdrew from Rojava to protect other parts of the, the country, which they deemed more important than the Kurdish region, of course, uh, which is otherwise known as Western Kurdistan. Kurdish political organizations then took over public offices, established self-defense forces, declared autonomy. Uh, they have been attacked by the Islamic State and Turkey since, but they maintain an autonomous administration based on communes, assemblies, councils in Kurdish and non-Kurdish areas. So uh, what is new about them? All three originate, uh, or what is common about them and new, of, of course, all three originate in liberation movements with socialist, anarchist and radical democratic pedigree. So they have uh, common themes like resistance to colonialism, to the nation state, to capitalism, to patriarchy, and uh, mm, all three movements with slight exception of Cheran, because uh, we cannot really with, certain, with, with that certainty say about Cheran, but with other cases, we can say they originate in the 1968 generation of uh, protest and revolutionary movements. So all three cases, again, they have no strict adherence to a single political ideology. So unlike all other revolutionary movements or nationalist liberation movements or national liberation movements or uh, whatever movement you can think of, uh, these three cases are different because they don't have a very strict ideology. And they are homemade synthesis of multiple ideologies. We can uh, count, but uh, let's pass because we won't have time to dwell on it much. So there are differences in scale in political ambitions. We have to see um, the, the case of Cheran is a small town. Uh, maybe you can have a look at it um, after the after the class, we will have the the slides with you. So I will just pass over this. Uh, it's important, but to emphasize that Cheran and, and the Zapatista region, they operate from within the Mexican constitution. So they don't have the aim of changing the whole constitution or um, um, let's say, uh, reforming the whole constitution in Mexico. They refer to the Mexican constitution as the basis of their uh, establishment, their autonomous administration. But the case of Rojava differs. It operates from without the constitution of Syria because basically Syrian and the predecessor of the Rojava, uh, let's say um, the, the project that is being implemented in Rojava originates from Turkey. And both the Turkish and Syrian constitutions are, are uh, to put it more blunt, to put it bluntly, let's say, they are racist constitutions because they prioritize the Turks and the Arabs. Uh, so, for for the case of Rojava, they will have to uh, replace the old constitution with a new one in order to survive. And also, of course, the 
indigenous uh, groups, indigenous peoples uh, are being more, uh, let's say, um, there is more leniency towards them in domestic and international law because they are not national minorities uh, in the sense that uh, there aren't competing um, claims to a homeland between different nations. So they are not traditionally national liberation movements because indigenous peoples as groups tend to be smaller and territories tend to be uh, smaller as well. So the leniency towards the uh, indigenous movements make their claims much more acceptable to domestic and of course international institutions and authorities while uh, in the case of national liberation movements it's not that uh, I say uh, I won't say easy, but it, it doesn't doesn't happen that um, smoothly. So uh, we can talk about it in the question and answer section. So how does then uh, from the council democracy, as we referred to it as a system based on small scale council, we 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 uh, trans. So these movements transform this form of government into a form of autonomy. Well, in the, in the case of Chiapas and Rojava, the most important element is to point out is the contact of revolutionaries with Mayan and Kurdish communities. These two movements um, uh, have very good connections with the people on the ground. And, uh, and of course, these connections with the people on the ground changed the revolutionaries. So the revolutionaries had to, after their communication or contact with people, felt the necessity to change their own top-down mentality of revolution, uh, bringing a revolution or carrying out a revolution. So they are humbled by communities and they adapt their programs to what they see and they experience on the ground. And uh, all of these cases, you can see that in the formation of these autonomous administrations, there is a civilian consultation before armed uprising going on. But in the case of Rojava and the Zapatistas, and in the case of uh, Cheran, because it's a different case, Cheran, they didn't, they don't have a guerrilla force. The, but even in their case, uh, they had. They had a consultation before setting up uh, the uh, the self-defense of the community, which they called Ronda Comunitaria in Tehran. They all abandoned the goal of seizing state power. So it's unthinkable for revolutionary movements or for national liberation movements to, uh, let's say, uh, forego or to let go of the goal, the ultimate goal of seizing state and becoming uh, the authority, the political authority within a state. So for any traditional or um, mainstream national liberation or revolutionary movement, this is unthink unthinkable. But along the way, they let go of this goal. So the, uh, the goal is not seizing state power, toppling the government and sitting in their seat, it's uh, now um, constructing, establishing, or constituting uh, autonomy from below uh, through bottom-up institutions, through direct participation, through self-defense, and offering solution to centuries-old problems. In all of these cases uh, that I was able to to see that a clear understanding of uh, providing solution to certain problems, get them uh, to the communities, uh, removes the barriers between the revolutionaries and the communities, so they they can uh, be accepted by the communities. And there is also community control over natural resources. Autonomy through, through councils, why? Well, because autonomy empowers communities, minorities can make their own laws, but this is not enough because uh, 
because individuals uh, can be, let's say, um, oppressed or repressed by communities. So direct democracy comes in as uh, it it provides individuals with with power. It empowers individuals with uh, with their presence in assemblies and councils when these decisions are made. So direct democracy empowers individuals, autonomy empowers communities. And small scale councils and assemblies, you know, they create uh, plural centers of power. So the less, the more centers of power, the less domination. This is in political theory, it has been known by, uh, through and by uh, many authors and, and thinkers and practitioners as well. So there are also values and institutions that come out of these three cases, as we can say, innovations and renovations. First, uh, there is no or little payment for public office to prevent political careerism, to prevent the birth or the, uh, let's say, dominance of a political class, a political elite. And there is no supreme leader uh, in, in all of these cases, although there might be, like in the case of Rojava, a, a figure, a spiritual leader. Uh, in case of Rojava as well, there are political parties, but their power is is diminished. But in Cheran and in, in the Zapatista region, there are no political parties. So this is an, an innovation in political organization. Prioritizing gender equality and women emancipation, it comes again uh, as, a, as an important innovation and renovation as well, because they uh, these political movements and the people who are within this administration will claim that, well, it used to be the case before modernization or before colonialism, and they are now reinstituting this gender equality between, uh, between two sexes. So uh, there, in the case of Rojava, there are also like councils, armed forces, and the veto rights of women uh, organizations, um, women-only councils and armed forces are there, uh, TV channels, magazines, news agencies. Uh, there is even uh, the science, the, the, the scientific discipline called genealogy, uh, which is uh, uh, which was established by women and is being carried out by women in, in Rojava. So there are innovations in political institutions, not, not only in organization, in institutions as well, uh, but you can take a look at it. I don't want to dwell on it so much. Uh, we have referred to it very shortly when we were passing by. Basically, in the representative systems of uh, power, Authority flows from top of a pyramid, like from presidents or from, let's say, the, the parliament to the lesser powers. But in the case of Rojavan, other uh, and Cheran, and um, it's just to help you visualize, uh, you can see the pyramid is here top down, not, uh, it's inverted. <laughs> so power flows from bottom to up the other way, the exactly other way around of the representative system. Another innovation uh, we can uh, refer to about concepts so concept, uh, and institutions. So consensus is sought in decision making. There is no supremacy of a higher authority. Uh, autonomy, not sovereignty, is being the, the claim made here. They don't make a claim to sovereignty. They think sovereignty is uh, not really a useful or a helpful concept. Plurality and diversity in collective political identities uh, coming for instead of a homogenized, you know, they don't talk about a homogenized nation or uh, a people or, or, or the nation as a collective identity. A world, so, sorry, many worlds within one world uh, or with the peoples that uh, these are certain innovations that we see in the, only in these um, autonomous administrations. There is also ecology, cosmovision, but we don't have much time to dwell on them. And uh, coexistence, all of these autonomous administrations, instead of trying to get rid of the state, they try, they say, well, the important thing is to uh, coexist. So, although 
uh, we would like to establish a new system of rule and government. We do not have the aim to just, you know, abolish all the states at once and bring this change will happen slowly. So coexistence is, is important. And I specifically ask if they will lay down their arms uh, in certain context. Uh, if the status, political status is constitutionalized, they say, yes, we could actually lay down the arms. But self-defense is important without self-defense, community self-defense, without it being institutionalized into constitutions, I don't think uh, the self-defense is going to go away because it's an important, very important part of these autonomous administrations. Uh, we will go to section three, conclusions. Thank you very much for bearing with me so far.